when in winter, icy wind and snow with peatless, heartless blocks begin to blow and harden up the surface of the palms encasing crystal crust on frozen frogs. When burrowing animals do what they do best and snuggle close together in the nest, except for one that pokes a curious snout with hopeful thrust into the open air and finding neither warmth nor comfort there retreats. When fiery Phoebus heavenward begins arise, but thinking better of it, grins but once and slips again to slothful sleep, thus shortening the day while counting sheep. Then students long to go to warmer climes, to travel south or hill and dale, sometimes perchance to dream of pilgrimage to Rome, or else a faithful lover safe at home. One dark and stormy night in such a season, for cold or dark or snow, whatever the reason, there were some travelers seeking honest shelter at an inn. Most wore plain cloth. A pelt or two adorned the richest, and the sheen of armor could beneath a cloak be seen. The place, a cozy inn, as I have said, could serve them victuals and provide a bed of straw, perhaps, or feathers for a dog, a grand accommodation for a scholar. For student types they were, both lads and lasses, and at this time of year the mountain passes echoed with their songs of love and wit, as all their bookish labors they would quit. On horse or ass, whatever they could find, perhaps on foot, they'd seek a peace of mind, of body too, but heed my admonitions. Too much friendly rest creates conditions music cannot cure. <laughs> and it's been said, a love song sings what's easier done instead. <laughs>
home. There is a modest courtyard, fully walled with hostelry, a stable, and a chapel. Travelers wishing to avoid Miss Happel go inside to pray and to be shriven, once winter's blast or just fatigue has driven them at last right off the beaten path before they feed the horse or take a bath. And so it was when these same students came. Some singly, some in pairs, their hearts aflame with pleasure of success, their cheeks aglow from brushes with the white and swirling snow. The Brenner Pass, behind them now it led. It was the single route, the only way from north to south across the Alps for miles, a hundred, maybe more, and so the piles of snow were worth the effort and the sleet, if only they could tell that to them. Now Innsbruck and Bavaria lay behind them. Another week or two at most would find them safe on level green Italian ground. But just for now, this night, they truly found some fellowship with warmth and fun together, a shield against the cold, inclement weather. A tired but a happy, boisterous crew, to pass the time they knew just what to do. As gradually they gathered in the hall, they joined in song until they shook the wall. <laughs> Past his prime, 
had been a soldier once upon a time. At 25, he'd gone to see the world, had seen the banners of the king unfurled in Palestine, and lived to tell the tale. And now he'd settled here to sell his ale, to tell the stories of the wars he'd fought, to drown his sorrows, and to banish thought. His beer was good, his conscience nearly free. In truth, a sadder Budweiser man was he. Oh. But he could tell a talent when he saw it, heard it, smelled it, chewed it raw. It didn't need to hit him on the head, but sometimes did at night, or so he said. At any rate, this host, a man named Walter, loved the music that he heard. A fault or blemish he could not at all discern, and so he told the students they could earn their supper, singing songs for all and him. He called for songs chock full of vigor, vim, and valor, charged them plainly all to find a song like this that Walter had in mind. <laughs>
and clapped him on the back, said it was great, upset that they had no laugh, but pleaded for a different kind of theme. In winter, you should know, one said, you dream of love and nothing else at all. The same is true for summer, spring, and fall, if truth be told, let be that as it is. <laughs> they begged him, save it for another day, and let them sing their songs of love and lust, put off the moralizing if he must. Then spoke a singer, springing to his feet. If music be the food of love, let's eat. <laughs>
happy game of song and love and food went on and on, though, frankly, somewhat crude it seemed to me the lyrics were, with double meanings left and right. It could mean trouble up ahead. I figured then this pastime Walter had devised would be the last time for a longish while he'd be so vexed. But now he only turned and hollered, Next! Parentes miki suet, matre long diores es, eratito torele, farse nun dinora. or two with friends to earn his meal, if that would do. While Walter thought, they readied what they had and found the list was long, and so the lad prepared to give the host an inventory. Trust me, friends, it was an epic story. Firstly, there were sundry five-string fiddles, rebecks, 
and a drum. And, oh, some diddles could be played, I think, upon record. Shongs that could be heard across the border were on tap, and with their softer cousins called Dusains and bagpipes, there were buzzing sounds of plenty to be heard. I'll take them all, cried Walter, maybe by mistake. <laughs> singer, quite bereft of voice. He sized her up and thought he'd take a chance and ask if she'd prefer instead to dance. She smiled at once and rose up like a flower to the morning sun. Her charm and power blossomed forth as on a day in June. 
embellishing with grace her wordless tune. was around this time that Walter sought relief. He didn't want to go, but he'd be brief, he thought, and not miss much. Two songs, no more. And so he turned and slipped out through the store. Now, Walter had a daughter who was comely, fair of face and form. She frolicsomely took this fleeting chance to sing a ditty of her own. And she was known as Pretty Maggie. She had learned a trick or two, a friendly scholar taught, in Latin. Knew just what she liked to do and how to bend a phrase to suit her will and meet her end. It was a thing of beauty to behold, to see young men uplifted from the cold. <laughs>
faltering, returning from the loo, beheld the scene and pondered what to do. He could eject them all, lock, stock, and barrel, throw them in the yard with their apparel on their backs and nothing more, or could he turn the other cheek? And so he stood transfixed, <laughs> as chiseled as a block of wood, when forward stepped a gentle maiden fair and touched him on the arm. He ceased his stare and looked her in the eye, an eye so bright it seemed to say that things would be all right if he would let it pass. So with constraint he sat and calmly listened to her plaint about the love a parent gave a child. It helped to make his troubled spirit smile.
received this song with some remorse and vowed to raise the tenor of discourse a semitone or two. <laughs> By strong consensus, they decided, if it weren't pretentious, they'd sing polyphony, though it was not at all their customary fare. The thought of parts entwined together while concording seemed most apt and pleasing. So accordingly, they racked their brains and made a choice, then sang with double and with triple voice.
One scholar now there was who kept apart somewhat, but seemed to have a cheerful heart since all the evening long he'd been attentive, writing in his book. <laughs> Though what incentive might have been for that, they did not know. They thought at first that he was rather slow for bringing homework with him on vacation. But he rebutted that with indignation. Backward, too, he went, while they went forthward. Only he of all was traveling northward. Seems he was a monk, or novice, rather. Sure, he worked the boys into a lather when they'd found he'd copied every word of every song, no matter how absurd, into his book. His Boyron Monastery, Benedictine, so he said, would very happily receive this book he wrote, Carmina Burana. But a note of music, not a one in all its pages could be seen. It seems to me outrageous, though he scattered dots and slashes round to represent the vaguest up and down, and though he memorized the tunes himself, the book may sit for centuries on the shelf, a silent testament to times like this. Would telling him, do you think, have spoiled his bliss? <laughs> descended on them like a dove. No thought remained of all those songs of love they'd just been singing. Heavy as a stone, the silence lay. No antiphon or tone of recitation. Wait, said one brave student slyly. 
I'm not the one. It might be prudent, or it mightn't. Whispers cause some eyes to open wide and jaws to drop. How wise a choice was this? But could it be a sin? Well, no, of course not. Let's begin. And they began, their voices loud and clear. It was the strangest psalm you'll ever hear. An odd selection for a benediction, but maybe fitting for a work of fiction. <laughs> Be it, 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 be it,